Hello, welcome to this introduction to R with R Studio. This is a workshop presented at the UQ Library, the University of Queensland Library. Uh, my name is Stéphane Guillou, I'm a trainer at the library, and I hope this uh, session is useful to you. The idea here is to give you, in uh, less than two hours, um, look at some of the most important features of the R programming language, this language for statistics, for data science, for data visualization, and also looking at RStudio, an extra tool that we can use on top of R to make it easier to write R code. So what we'll try and do is show you the benefits of using a programming language and point you to the main building blocks that you can use with this programming language. By no means we try and show you a very thorough overview of what the language is made of, uh, but we try and introduce you to the most important bits so you can get started quickly and start working on your own data analysis on your own project. And we'll try and also give you some best practice as well to make your life easier in the future. We've got this material available online, so you can find the link under the video in the description if you want to follow along. Uh, but the best thing you can do is watch the video and practice uh, at the same time in our studio, write the same commands, do the same thing, learn by doing. And use this as a reference later on if you missed anything or we want to go back to the notes. If you need to install R and RStudio, there's two pieces of software that you need for this workshop. The website for the R project is r-project.org. You can find the software on there. You can see that the latest release is this one, 4.1.0. And to download it and install it, you can go to download R and pick a mirror or a website that's closest to you. So I am in Australia, so I'm going to go to this one and then follow the links to the instructions relevant to your platform, the operating system that you use. R is a, in an open source programming language that's extremely popular currently uh, in data science, in science in general. And it works on Linux, Mac OS and Windows. And once you have that installed, you can grab the latest release. 4.1.0 at the time of recording this video. You can then move on to installing RStudio on top. So you can go to rstudio.com. RStudio is a company that releases this open source tool that is the most popular tool people use with the programming language R. You can head to products in the menu and then to RStudio and follow the links to the free version of RStudio. It is RStudio desktop that you're after. The open source edition. And then you can pick your free version for your operating system. Again, an open source program that you can get for the major platforms, the major operating systems, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. I am currently using Linux, uh, a Linux distribution called Ubuntu. But most of what we'll see today, or everything that we'll see today, will work exactly the same on the major platforms. I've got both R and RStudio installed. So what I'll do now is move to opening RStudio. I've got it here already opened. This is what RStudio looks like. And we are going to start only using this part on the left hand side. This is the console. You can see the name of the, this tab, the console at the top here, and start writing commands, instructions for R. Now, before we start, I just want to give a, a quick idea of why you might want to use R, a programming language in general, but R specifically for doing data analysis, data cleaning, data visualization. So if I already mentioned that R and RStudio are both open source, so it is a program that you can take with you wherever you go. Uh, it allows you to write code to detail exactly how your data is processed, imported, cleaned up, 
are transformed, visualized, analyzed. So you write your own history of commands and you're really transparent about what has happened to the data. And that really increases reproducibility in science. Uh, it's one step forward where we can share with others the exact process that we've used to get to our conclusions. And because it's a programming language, it is very customizable. You can use those basic building blocks you learn about to then create more complex processes that maybe no one has ever thought of before. So you can create your own program from scratch. Programming languages also can deal with very large data sets. Uh, often when compared to graphical uh, programs for data analysis, they're often able to handle uh, bigger data sets in the millions or billions of lines of data. And finally, you also can harness the very large ecosystem that there is around R. It is uh, a big community, and often it is a very welcoming community, a very bubbly community that creates a lot of extensions to the language. So you'll be able to uh, extend and install extra tools that have been designed by others to make your work easier. So you don't have to write everything from scratch. Now it is a programming language, so the learning curve is a little bit steeper than graphical interfaces. Uh, however, as far as programming languages go, it is a, a one of the ones that are easier to pick up. So let's get right into it by using this console. You can see a little blurb at the top that tells you which version of R you are using. In particular, the first line here says that we've got version 4.1.0 and when it was released. There's uh, important information in there as well on how to cite the software when you make use of it. What we'll do first at this prompt, what we call the prompt here, this is your little blinking cursor that's waiting for input, and this greater than symbol. This is where you can start typing a command, an instruction for R. So for example, we could start writing the operation 10 minus 2. 10 minus 2 with a dash in between two numbers, and to execute or evaluate this command, we can press enter on the keyboard. And this sends the instruction to R, and R will give you an answer if there is an answer to give. So it executes the code, gives you the output. And you can think of it as input and output. Your input is your command, and your output is this result of the operation. So 10 minus 2 is 8. Let's try a couple more. 3 times 4, that's the asterisk, and this is very common to other programs. When you write a formula, for example, in a cell in Microsoft Excel or LibreOffice Calc, it's very similar. 3 times 4 with the star or the asterisk, you get the result 12. And if I write the operation 2 plus 10 divided by 5, remember that the order of operation is the same as when doing arith arithmetics anywhere. 10 divided by 5 will happen first, and then you'll get the addition 2 plus 2. That's 4. So you're using R just like a little calculator. You're writing commands, sending those instructions to the language, getting a result out of it. And a lot of what you'll do will rely on those maths that you can, um, that you can do in R like in most programming languages. But you probably want to start to remember things and store information in R. And the way to store data for later reuse, so you can use it over and over again, is to create what we call objects. So I'm going to create a new object called num1 and use the assignment operator. The assignment operator looks like this. It's two characters, smaller than and hyphen. I might let's just zoom in once more so it's a bit clearer. Smaller than and hyphen makes up this little arrow that goes towards the left. 
and then I'll put the value that I want to store. So I've create, I'm creating an object called num1 and I'm storing the value 42 inside it. Press enter and it seems like nothing happens in the console. There's no output. We've got input, there's no output. If there's no message that comes up, if there's no error message, if there's nothing, it probably means that it has worked as expected. So now that I've created this object, num1, I've given it this name. You can give it a name that's quite descriptive of what it contains. I can reuse num1, for example, write the name, press enter, and get the value out, 42. And I can use that name, that object, in an operation as well. num1 plus 1 is 43. Now I'm going to create another object called num2. Again, use the assignment operator. And it's going to be the result of num1 divided by 9, for example. So here, the order of operation it will, will be that this operation is calculated first, num1 divided by 9, and the result is stored inside num2. Press enter. And now if I retrieve the value stored by num2, I get 4.666, etc. Now the first thing that our studio helps us with is that it adds panels around the console that help you work more efficiently or understand what you're doing. And the first one we are having a look at today is the environment. If you used R on its own, you would be using just the console using the language interactively, writing commands, executing them, getting a result. Moving on to the next one. But when you create objects, it's really useful to have this little reminder of what you've created so far in the environment. You can see that there's num1 with the value 42 and num2 with the value 4.666, etc. So we always have this little list of objects and what they contain in the environment. Now we talk about objects in R, but in other programming languages you might have heard this concept as a variable. If we stick to what people use the most in R, it would be the word object, and I'll stick to that. Now I just want to show you that you can replace an object or the value that it contains. For example, I write M1 assignment operator contains now the value 43. And two things to notice here are that, first of all, R doesn't tell you that num1 already exists. It's a very common operation in a programming language to update the value that an object contains. So it does that straight away as, as quickly as possible. The other thing is that num2 hasn't changed. Num2 is still the same value. And that's because those two are not dynamically linked. Num2 is the result of num1 divided by 9 back when we created it. And that's a static value, it's not going to change. So if you wanted to update the value of num2, you would have to rerun this command. Now we're dealing with just numbers here, but there's a few different data types available in R. So for example, if I want to store some text data, I'm going to write sentence as the object name, for example. And I'll have to use double quotes around the text that I want to save. I'm going to write here, hello world, in between double quotes. When I press enter, I ah, is pretty happy to, to do that. It can store text data inside an object, as you can see. Now the kind of data that you deal with does matter because for example I am able to do num1 plus 1 as you can see here but if I do sentence plus 1 we'll get our first error for the day. It tells me error in sentence plus 1. Let's make some more space. Non-numeric argument to binary operator and you get a lot of this um, 
vocab that might seem quite obscure to start with. We can break it down and try and understand it. So the binary operator here is the plus sign that we used in the command and the non-numeric argument is a sentence. One is numeric, but sentence is not. It's what we call characters, a character string. So it didn't know what to do. R doesn't know how to sum a number to text data, to a character string. So the kind of data that you deal with will matter. You will be able to do some things with some kinds of data, but other kinds of data not. Now we're using this assignment operator quite a bit in R, so if you want a shortcut for it, you can use Alt dash or Alt hyphen on your keyboard. You will add this assignment operator with spaces around it. So that's one to get used to in R if you don't want to type it by hand. Now let's talk about functions. Functions are little programs that are available in R out of the box. You start an R session, you've got access to those little programs that do little jobs. And they will always look the same. You'll have a function name, and then you'll have parentheses opened and closed. Now, sometimes you've got something in between those parentheses. Sometimes you've got nothing. Sometimes you've got several things. And what we put in between those parentheses are called arguments. You can have argument one, argument two, but the names might depend on the function that you're using. So this is the structure of the function. There's a name for the function, the parentheses right after it, and then arguments, which are the options for your function. What do you want to do with the function? So let's try one that's called round. I want to round the number 1.23. Let's do 1.234. So round the number 1.234. 1.234 is the argument that I put in between the parentheses. When I press enter, round returns the value 1. It has rounded the value to the closest integer, 1. So pretty simple job here for this function. It says what it, it does what it says on the box. But if you want to learn more about the function, you can use the question mark and then type the name round. Press enter, and this will open the documentation on the right hand side. So I'll make this bigger so we can explore a help page. This is about rounding of numbers, and this is a great thing about our studio as well is that you've got a help tab that gives you access to the documentation without leaving this window. Scrolling through, we can see that this documentation page actually contains information about uh, five different functions. We've got ceiling, floor, trunk for truncate, round, and signif for significant digits. If we keep scrolling down, we can see that there's a section called usage, which is often the one you go straight to, to see how you can write your code and what arguments are available for the functions. So we've got our round function here, and we can see that there's actually two arguments we could use, x and digits. And if we don't understand what the arguments are, we can keep scrolling to arguments, and get an explanation, a description of what each one does. So for digits, our second argument, you can see that we can specify the number of decimal places. So I could change my previous command before I wrote round the number 1.234. But here I want to use the second argument and say 2 for digits. I want two decimal places. Press enter, and now I get 1.23, because I've got two decimal places. So I can change the default behavior of the function, round. By using an extra argument, I don't have to use it, but I can if I want to. 
and by default digits is set to zero. Right. So I could have done the same thing, for example, for round num two at two digits as well. There you go. Now this operation, you've seen that there is a name for the argument digits and x. You could name your arguments if you wanted to. I could have said x equals num2 and digits equals 2. And this is exactly the same thing. These two commands, oops, these two commands are completely equivalent. In one case, I named the arguments. In the other, I could omit that information because I'm using the arguments in order. So if you give values to the arguments in the order that they come up in the documentation, first x, second digits, you can omit the names. But naming arguments is really useful because sometimes you just want to use a handful of them when there's dozens available. So you can pick and choose and place them in whatever order you want. In documentation pages, coming back to this right hand side panel, there's more information in there. There's often way more than you actually need because this is a documentation page that will be useful to many different people who want to use the function for many different, many different use cases. But one part that's also important is all the way at the bottom, you should always have a bunch of examples. So this is code that you can run. You can copy and paste that into the console and try it. And usually it's uh, examples of commands that do something interesting with the function. So we're going to practice finding help about functions. Another one that I want to introduce to you is the C function. I'm going to straight away open the help page for C, and that's lowercase c. The case does matter in function names and object names in R. You do an argument names as well. You do need to respect the case, lowercase or uppercase. So here, this is lowercase c. After a question mark, execute that and you'll get the help page about this function that's very common in R code. It's an extremely common one because it allows you to put several values together in one single object. And I wanted to show you this one because it has this weird argument called the ellipsis of the three dots, which basically means any number of arguments. Because with the C function, you can put any number of things together in one single object. And if you look at the description, it says that the three dots is the objects to be concatenated or combined. If you think of the C function as the abbreviation of something, it's combine or concatenate. So let's try that. Let's create an object called, for example, ages for the ages of my dogs. And let's say that I've got a dog who's four, another one who's 10, another one who's two. One of them I don't know, so I'm going to say NA, missing data, not available. And then three. So I've got five elements in the five arguments in my C function. I'm grouping them all together and putting them into an object. Press enter. And if you look at your environment, you'll see this new object called ages. It is a numeric object. So it says num here. It looks a bit different to the other ones. It shows us the data, but it also says how many values there are. So we can see that there's five elements in there. And now I've grouped my ages together because it makes sense to have them in one spot. So now I could, for example, use a plotting function, say bar plot, to create a bar plot of my dog ages. I put ages as the first argument, the data that I want to visualize. Press enter, and you get this little bar plot in your plots window. So one bar per dog, and there's the missing one here. And that's one strength of the R programming language is that it provides lots of plotting functions out of the box. You don't need to install anything extra. You can already create lots of visualizations that are very customizable as well um, without 
installing anything extra. And for a programming language, it's not that common. Another thing you can do with these vectors, what we call vectors, we call usually a vector where, uh, an object that has several uh, several values. What you can do is multiply ages by another number, like seven, and you get your dog ages in human years. And I get a vector as an output that's of the same length. There's still five elements in there, and each one is the age multiplied by seven. So it has multiplied each element by seven. And there's still one missing value there. So if you want to do a challenge about looking up documentation about different functions, I'll give you three functions that you can explore. There's one that's called rep.int. There's one that's called mean, and there's one that's called rm. If you want, you can po pause this uh, video, look up the documentation for each one of these, and then try and write some code that makes use of them. See if you can do something interesting with it, and see if you can bring errors, because that's the, probably the best way to learn, is to create, break things and uh, learn from your mistakes. rep.int mean RM. So let's have a look at the first function, rep.int. We can open straight away the documentation, rep.int, after a question mark. This page is about replicating things. There's a couple of functions available, rep, rep.int, and rep, rep underscore len. And rep.int in particular allows you to repeat something a certain amount of times. So for example, if you find something very funny, you could say rep.int is ha. And the second argument, for example, 100, so you can repeat ha 100 times. Now you get a vector of length 100 with that thing repeated 100 times. And now maybe the, this little number that's at the beginning of all the outputs is a bit more uh, obvious what it means. When you've got output that overflows over several lines, at the beginning you've got the index of the element, the first element. So for example, we know that this element is element 100 in the vector. Moving on to the next one, that's the mean function. So it's pretty self-explanatory what it does. It's to calculate the mean of several numbers. So for example, if I want the mean of my ages, I could try mean of ages as an argument, but I get the answer NA. And this might not be what you expect. You might expect to get an, a value out of calculating the mean of these five ages. But we've got missing data, and R being a statistical language, it makes sense to have a safe default like this one, where when there's missing data in your data set, it's gonna, and you're trying to get a value, or like you're trying to take all those values and return one single value, it's gonna tell you, I can't tell you because I'm missing data. However, if you look at the help page, question mark mean, you might spot an argument that will be useful. If you look in this line here, you've got a couple of arguments extra, including one called na.rm. And this is a very common argument that's set to false by default. But you, you can flip that switch and set it to true instead to say, I want to remove the missing data before doing the calculation. If you look at the description of na.rm here, it says it's a logical value indicating whether missing data should be stripped before the computation proceeds. So I can change my default behavior in the console and say mean of ages with the option na.rm equals to true. So false and true are those logical values. They kind of a switch, yes or no. 
and you can flip that switch to change the setting and now you get an average 4.75 And you'll find this argument n.rm in a lot of different functions. It's a very common one. Basically, any function that takes several values and gives you one as a result will have that option. Finally, there's the function rm. This might be less obvious what it does. So you can do question mark rm, and you'll find that rm stands for remove. This function has two versions or two names, you can use them interchangeably, the short one rm or the full one remove. And it has again that ellipsis argument. And this is for putting all the objects in there that you want to remove from your environment. Currently we've got four objects. So let's say you don't like num1, you want to remove it, you can do rm and as an argument num1. Press enter and it deletes it uh, directly. One thing to notice here is that R will not put that, or it will not ask you first, do you want to remove this? Are you sure you want to do that? And then it will not put it, say, in a rubbish bin where you're going to retrieve it uh, later on. If you want to bring it back, what you'll have to do is run the command again that created it. Because removing objects that are you know, useless after a while is a very common thing. And again, the programming language does what you ask it to do, and it does it quickly. If you want to bring back num1, what you'll have to do is go to your history, or you can write the command straight away. You can go to your history, which is the tab right next to the environment. You can find all the, con all the commands that you've uh, executed before. And you can also search for the one that's relevant. If I search for num1, it will pop up. Num1 is 43 or num1 is 42. Double click on that, execute it again to bring it back. Now I do get that warning because I am very zoomed in to my uh, interface. And that's an issue with my, uh, my plotting area if I'm too zoomed in. So to remove those messages, I'll close my graphic device just for now. Okay. So <clears throat> to remove more than one object, you can definitely list them just like we've done with the C function. But there's an argument here that's interesting called list. I'll bring up the documentation here. There it is. It says list, a character vector naming objects to be removed. But you might be wondering, why do I want to use this one instead of just listing them in the three dots? Another function that could be useful is ls. This one I can use without arguments. I just open and close the parentheses behind the name of the function. Press enter and you get a list of all the objects you have in your environment currently. So I'll write this command that uses the list argument with the function ls. And you can have a think for a minute, what do you think this will do? As I press enter, think about the order of execution of the different parts of it. What will happen is that ls will list all those objects and then pass that vector of names to the list argument and the function rm will remove everything. So if I look at my environment, I've got four objects. If I execute the command, press enter, they're all gone in, a, in less than a second. You will see this little bit of code quite often in tutorials when you move on to something else and you want to clean up the environment to free some some uh, screen real estate or make it a bit <clears throat> clearer what's going on, you can clean up your environment with this. So I'm nesting a function inside another one and we're starting to do more interesting things here by combining functions together. 
Now let's find other ways to find help. First of all, if we stay inside our studio, what I can do is use the help tab here to search for terms. So say I'm interested in analysis of variance, I can do analysis of variance. In my search, press enter, and you'll get different functions, different documentation pages that contain those terms. So you'll see that there's functions like AOV or MANOVA for multivariate analysis of variance or ANOVA test, etc. that might be useful for analysis of variance. So that's a free text search. And there's also this home button here that you can use to have a few suggestions of um, documentation and tutorials related to R and R Studio. So if you want the full official tutorial for R, which will take longer than this short introduction, you can go to an introduction to R. If you want to learn more about importing and exporting data, you can use this one. And one that I really recommend is from R Studio. there's a bunch of cheat sheets. There are those two-sided PDFs that give you an overview of specific extensions, packages. Really handy to have printed on an A5, <coughs> sorry, A3 page and keep on, on your desk. Right. Now, outside of R Studio, what you will do very often, and everyone does that, even people who have used the language for years and years and years, is go to the browser and start searching for a question, asking the internet a question. So here I'm, for example, wondering how do I remove an element from a vector in R? How to remove an element from a vector in R? So I'm trying to be clear about my question, my problem, saying what programming language I'm talking about. And you'll get a bunch of results, including videos, if that's how you like to learn things, some tutorial websites, lots of different websites offering you information, documentation, tutorials about the programming language and how to do specific tasks, blog posts, etc. One particular website that you'll end up on quite often is Stack Overflow, and it's highlighted here on the right. <clears throat> I'll open this one in a new tab, and this is, maybe I'll go to this one as a better example. And this is someone asking a question, how to delete multiple values from a vector? There's a detailed description of what they're after. People can upvote and downvote questions, and then you get answers. And it looks like eight people have provided an answer. You'll often find that there's more than one right answer. With programming languages, it's very often the case. And people will also upvote and downvote quest, uh, sorry, answers. And the person who asked the question can also give it the green tick of approval. So it looks like this one is the most popular and the one that was picked as the right one. So there's a bit of an explanation, sample of code that you can reuse. It looks like they gave a lot of detail, which is nice. But then you can also keep scrolling and seeing if there's other relevant answers, especially if there's more recent ones, because programming languages do evolve. People write also new functions, so you might have an easy way to do things or a more efficient way to do things, etc. Very useful resource, this website, Stack Overflow, questions and answers, not only about R, it's about lots of different programming languages. And you can see under the question here that there is an R tag. So people categorize the questions. And I want to show you that if you put your cursor on this one, you'll see that there's more than 400,000 questions that have been asked already about the R programming language. So if you've got a question, it is very likely that you already have an answer available online, especially on this website. Now back in our studio, 
what we'll do now is move on to having a look at an example project. I'm going to show you what a data analysis might look like for you. It will be a very simplistic project, but it might give you an idea of how you want to work, how you want to get started and, and manage your different data analysis in R and R Studio. Currently, we're not using any project. If you look at the top right of your R Studio window, you'll see project none. We're not in any project. If you look at your files tab, you'll see that you're currently in your home directory. Oh, actually, this is true because I was using it differently before, but you should be in your home directory by default. So anything you do with files, with reading files, importing things, and with exporting things will happen by default in your home directory, which is not a great way to work. What I really recommend, and a lot of people do recommend, is working with projects. As soon as you get into RStudio, you know that you're going to start a new analysis, something that's unrelated to what you've done before. What you'll do is go to the project menu at the top right and click on new project. The alternative to that is to go to the file menu at the top left, go to the new project button. So we'll use that now. And the first question we'll get in this little dialogue is, do you want to save your workspace image into an R data file? This basically means, do you want to save what you've got in your environment, like objects that you've created so far? We don't have anything of value, so we're going to say don't save, and we'll get back to that after our project as well. Because this is the, what I recommend to do every time, to not save what you've got in your environment. but I'll detail more why a bit later on. When we create a project, we can create it in a new directory or an existing directory. We will create a new one today, but if you already have data in one spot, you can create in an existing directory. I'm going to go to new directory, the first one, and the project type, there's a few different options here, but we'll stick to the vanilla new project the first choice as well. You can give a name to your project and I like to start with a date. So I've got easy sorting of my many projects. So I'm going to say that today's date is the 9th of August 2021 and the name of the project, well this is an R Studio intro, R and R Studio intro. So I'm going to name it as such. This is going to be the name of our project as well as the name of where it is, the directory where we save everything. And then we can decide where this goes. So I can click on browse to find a better spot than the default. If you see the tilde on its own, it means your home directory. Click on browse. I've got one spot called our projects where I save everything. I'm happy with this one. So it's going to create a new project, a new directory called this, inside my R projects directory. And once I'm happy with these two, I can click create project. So it's switching to that different project. And if you look at the top of your window, or if you look at the project menu, you'll see the name of your project has changed. If you look at your files, you'll see that we're now in that new location. You can only see one single file right now called rproj, or finish, finishing with rproj. That's your R project file that you can reopen to go back to your project. And if you look at the breadcrumbs at the top, you can see where you are located. So this is your default spot on your computer. This is your default working directory. Again, if you use files, it will look for them here by default. If you save files, it will save them here by default. Your environment doesn't contain anything. It's all clean, fresh, and you've got a, a brand new uh, session on the left-hand side in the console. A bit more setting up of our project. We need to do a few things here. I'm going to 
create a couple of directories in this project to put our files in different spots. I'm going to create one called scripts and I can use a command to do that. I can say dir.create and then write script in between double quotes as an argument. So there's a function that allows you to create directories, dir.create. And then as an argument, you give the name of the directory. Press enter and you can see that this is our working directory. If I use this command, it creates a directory by default here. I'll do that again with dir.create data this time to create a data directory. And if you want to reuse functions in your console, or if you want to fix up something that you got wrong, you can use your up arrow, press up, and it will go through your history of commands. You can see that it brings back the latest one. And then if you keep going, it goes through your whole history of commands, which is really handy to reuse something, slightly modify it, or fix up something that didn't work before. So I've used two commands to execute or to, to create directories, right? But if I wanted to, I could have gone with new folder, this button that's at the top here and written the name of the folder here, the directory. I could also have gone to my files, gone into the directory of my project and created a new folder, right? So there's a few ways to do the one thing. I just wanted to show you that you do have access to those functions if you need them. They exist in R. You have functions that allow you to do things with files and directories that affect your uh, hard drive, right? If you need them, they're there. If you find them convenient, you can use them. And also it allows you to use them in your programs to automate things. For example, if you need to create dozens of different directories that follow a certain naming logic, you might not want to do that by hand and possibly having typos in there. You can use a script. You can write some R code to do that automatically for you in a couple of seconds. So options are important. The other thing that we'll do now is to write our code. We won't be using the console but we want to start storing our process, storing the commands that we write to process our data. So we're going to write it in a script. If you go to the new file menu here, it's the first icon in your toolbar. You can click on our script. That's the first one, the top one. You can see again, different ways to do things. You've got a shortcut, you've got a menu item, and you could use also a function to create it. There's a function called file.create. It creates a temporary directory. Let's start writing a couple of what we call comments in there. I'm writing a line that starts with a hash symbol. And this is a line that will be ignored by R because R knows that this is a comment, uh, that it doesn't contain code, it's just free text to describe things. So I'm gonna say that the description of this file is intro to R and R Studio, and this is an example project. And next line, I'll say that the author is my name. You can put your name here. And if you know that you're going to say, share this, it is, um, you could add something like your contact and possibly uh, date started, for example, right? So a bit of metadata that is important for others to understand what is in the file, to know how to use it, to know who to contact if there's a problem with it. So all those lines that start with a hash symbol, with a pound symbol, will allow you to document your code. Let's straight away save the file because it is a temporary file. So. You can use the floppy disk icon, you can use Control S 
like in most programs. And by default, again, it saves it in your working directory, in your project directory. But remember, we've created a scripts directory, so we might as well keep, keep things nice and tidy. Let's call this one process. This is my default name for a script. But if you've got a script that does something precise, for example, a script that's specifically about cleaning data, call it cleaning. One that's about data visualization, maybe call it visualization. Process is my generic name for a script. Click Save. And you can see at the top of your code editor, your script editor, the name is there, process. It adds the extension dot capital R. And that's because it is a simple text file that can be edited with pretty much anything. But we want to make it clear that it contains R code. So the extension for R code is dot capital R. Right. So that's it, we're pretty much set up. We've got our project. We've got some directories in our project that allow us to keep things nice and tidy. And then <clears throat> we've got a script that allows us to store the code that we write instead of just testing things in the console. Now, the first thing we'll do for this project is import some data. And the data set that we import is the gapminder data set. It's an example data set about different countries at different time points and some uh, socio-economical indicators. So let's import that data set. And for that, you can copy the command that is listed in the description. So the command starts with download.file. I'm going to add a line for a comment here that we can fill in as we explain what it is. Download.file is a function. And if you want to find out more about it, you can use our question mark name of the function. Alternatively, you can use the shortcut F1 to open the documentation. And that's with your cursor in the name. So let's say I click on download.file and then press F1 on my keyboard, the function key. It opens the documentation. It allows you to open the documentation without having to run a command, which is really handy. If you want to, you can take a minute, pause, pause the video and uh, have a look at what you think this command will do when I execute it. So this whole thing is one single command. Look through the documentation, try and think about what it will do, what you expect it to do, and then execute it to see what it does. Now to execute from the script, you will need to get used to one shortcut, which is control plus enter, control enter or control return, or if you're on a Mac, possibly command enter. And that's to execute from script. This is exactly equivalent to this run button that's at the top here. Here it says, when I put my cursor on it, run the current line or selection, and the shortcut is control enter. So if I click on this, or if I use control enter, it will execute that command you will get some text in there that might be red if you've got the default theme in our studio. It might be scary because you think it's an error, but it is only feedback. It's just a message. If it doesn't say error, it's not an error. It's telling us that it's trying to get to that website and then it finds some plain text. It gives you the character encoding that it's using. It gives you the size of the file. And it looks like it has downloaded the file as expected. So the function download.file will take a location or URL where the file is located. This is our CSV file that's located online, stored online. And then the test file argument specifies where we want to save it. And here it says data forward slash gapminder data.csv. So it's the path and the name for the file 
And if you go to files now and look at screen, uh, sorry, data, you will see gapminderdata.csv that we just downloaded. So it has worked. There's our file. When you go to your files tab, you can navigate your directories. You can go back by using the breadcrumbs here, or you can also use these little two dots here to go up one. All right, so we downloaded the file, but we haven't imported it just yet. So the first step here is download the file, save in the data directory. The second step that we want to use here is to import or read the data into an object so we can use it inside R. Just like we created objects before, we're going to give it a name, Capminder. Use the assignment operator. And we'll use a function here that's called read.csv, which does what it says on the box. It reads a CSV file. So read.csv. And then we need at least one thing where the file is. So we can reuse exactly that path here. But I'll show you that there's another shortcut that's really handy in our studio, and that's the tab autocompletion. If I start typing, for example, CSV, I can press the tab key on my keyboard and it auto-completes to this whole path, which is really handy. It, also, it saves you a lot of typing. And you can do that with file paths, like we just did. You can also do that with functions. You can auto-complete with functions. So for example, if I went to find a function that starts with read, if I press the tab key, it will autocomplete to the first one in the list. Or if it doesn't list anything just yet, it will give me a list of options. And you can see that there's quite a few read functions to import things. So let's execute this one. Read the file gapminderdata.csv in the data directory. Press Control Enter. And you should end up with an object in your environment called gapminder. <coughs> tells you the size of it. It looks a bit different to the objects that we had before. It tells us that it's got 1704 observations, that's the number of rows in your table, and six variables, that's your number of columns. And if you click on the blue arrow that's next to the name in the environment, you will have an easy overview of the different variables or columns in your data set. So it looks like there's data about different countries from different continents, data collected in different years, looks like it might start in 1952, and there's the population, life expectancy in years, and the GDP per capita, so gross domestic product per person, in US dollars. So that gives us a nice quick overview of what the data is, what it contains, and how R has imported it too, because it gives us the kind of data right next to the name of the column. If I want to see the data into a little spreadsheet viewer, I can click on the line in the environment, or I can click on that little spreadsheet icon that's to the right. If you click on that, it opens an extra tab Gapminder, and I can scroll through the data. And really, this is the viewer. You can see that in the console, our studio actually run the command view Gapminder, which opens this. So quite a few rows of data here. It looks like it's alphabetically ordered. It starts in 1952, maybe. And I can search for particular terms. For example, Australia. There it is. I can use the headings to sort the data, I can use filters as well. So for example, if I only want to, a particular range of years, I can use that filter as well. But anything that you do in the viewer is really only about viewing and exploring. It's not about modifying your data. 
you can't modify it in this little window here. So all the sorting and filtering that won't modify your actual gapminder object. Closing this tab or going back to my script, I want to now explore the data a little bit. Okay, so a couple of functions that might be useful to explore data to familiarize yourself with it. The function head on the dataset gapminder, that's the argument that you use in it, will give you by default the six first rows of your dataset. So that's a good way to quickly see what's at the top. And to have a look at the bottom of the dataset, that would be the tail function, tail of gapminder. Control enter. You can see the last few rows. So it definitely looks like it's ordered alphabetically for the country. Inside the functions, there's other options in head and tail. If I want to see more or less, I can definitely change that. I can say I just want to see three rows of data. That's the second argument. And it only gives me three. One function that's quite handy is the str function for structure. It will work for, with all kind of object. <clears throat> if I use str on gapminder, it will give me information that's very similar to what I've got in my environment already, but just a little bit extra. It tells me what kind of object it is, and it's called a data frame. So when you read with the function read.csv, when you import data with it, it creates a data frame. If you look at the documentation for read.csv, it should tell you under the part, there's a lot of information in there, under the part value, what kind of value it returns when you execute it. It tells us data frame. And data frame is a very useful data structure in R that stores a table of data, two-dimensional table of data, rectangular data, with different columns of different kinds. That's often how we store data in lots of fields in science. In this documentation, while we are at it, you can see that there's a lot of arguments available for read.csv. There's a general function called read.table, which is handy for reading lots of different kinds of data all kinds of tables of data stored as text. A lot of options in there, but you've got more specific functions like read.csv that have sensible defaults, like is there headings for the columns? Uh, what is the separator between columns? What is the decimal point for numeric data, etc. So if you need those settings, you can definitely change them. For example, if you need to adapt how the missing data is stored, you can use this argument. na.strings, if it's something different, for example, you've got a data set that stores missing data as minus 99999, sometimes uh, there's data sets that are like that, you can change that value and it will understand it as missing data. Moving on to couple more uh, options here, functions. If you need to access specific values like the number of rows or number of columns, you can do n row of gapminder. That's the number of rows. n col of gapminder. That's the number of columns. And the names of columns or the headings can be accessed with the names function. Names of gapminder will give you the names of all the columns to have a quick look at what variables you've got. Now R is a statistical language, so out of the box you've got a bunch of statistical functions, methods, analyses that are available. We don't get into statistical analysis in depth in this one, just give you just one function to get us to get summary statistics. 
a function that works with pretty much anything is summary. And again, I'm going to give it the gapminder dataset as the single argument. And when you execute that, I'll make some more space, you can see it gives me an overview of the data, summary statistics for the different variables, but it's more interesting for the numeric ones. So for year, for example, now we can confirm that we've got data going from 1952 to 2007, because that's the minimum and max. And we can see, for example, that uh, the maximum life expectancy in this data set is 82.60 years and the median GDP per capita is 3,531 or 32 US dollars. But lots of functions you can use here for, to go into more interesting statistics depending on your data because it will vary a lot between fields. I want to finish this little exploration with um, a plotting function. We saw one just before, but what if you wanted to have a look at the relationship? And we're going to do here GDP per capita versus life expectancy. So using a built-in plotting function called plot, which is quite generic. We can use the Gapminder dataset and then access specific columns by using the dollar sign. So Gapminder dollar sign and then the name of the column, GDP per cap. This will go as the first argument on the x-axis. You can see the, the little tooltip here tells you the, the two first arguments. So the first argument is x, the second argument will be the y-axis. So I'm going to say Gapminder dollar sign life expectancy, life exp. Remember to respect those capitals as they are used in the data set. If you need a reminder, you always have your environment that lists the names, but you also have the tab auto completion. So when I type capminder dollar sign, I've got suggestions and I can start typing GDP, press the tab key auto completes. If I execute this on its own, let's have a look at it. Control enter. Right, there's my plot, but I've used, <laughs> and you can see my error. I've got a straight line there. That's because I used GDP per cap twice. What I wanted here is life exp. So I can go back to my code because I'm using a script. It's easy to go back to the function or to the command that I didn't write quite right. Fix it up executed again and I get those circles for each one of my values <clears throat> and I can further customize my plot if I want to for example I can put a comma and add extra arguments there's an argument called xlab for the label of the x-axis I'm going to say GDP per capita in US dollars and the next argument after a comma will be ylab. I'm going to say that's life expectancy in years. Now remember to use those double quotes around your text. Any text that you use in R, you'll have to specify that it is a character string by using those double quotes. Execute that again. Control enter. RStudio understands that this, these three lines of code are one single command, so that works fine. And you get your updated visualization with your labels. So it looks like there is a relationship there, which doesn't necessarily mean there is causation, but there is correlation, it seems. However, in, if you're interested in data visualization, yes, you can do a lot with the base R plotting functions. That's what we call them, the functions that come with R out of the box. But a lot of people have created extra packages, extensions for data visualization. And we do have a workshop on ggplot2 or several workshops on ggplot2, the most popular package for data visualization in the world of R.
So do you tag along to those ones if you want to learn more about data visualization. Moving on to packages now. So I've mentioned that packages are extensions to R, extra functions that you can easily install and use. If I go to the website that we opened before to install R, there's a page called packages on the left hand side. And you can see that currently there's 17,973 packages available hosted just on this um, repository. CRAN stands for Comprehensive R Archive Network. It's the main repository for our packages and for distributing the software itself. And you can easily from R install any of those 17 or 18,000 packages roughly. And each one of those packages contain possibly one um, or several functions to use. They, they also provide data sets. Some packages are tiny, some packages are huge, uh, complete frameworks uh, to do new things. So make the most out of those ones. You can see the list of packages here and you can search for particular uh, topics. And also what I recommend having a look at is the CRAN task views that's here, linked here, or you can find it in the left hand side as well, task views. And this gives you recommended packages depending on what you're studying. So there's lots of different topics here and you can explore some of the most important packages in there. But let's have a look at how you can install a package and then make use of it. The first step in the process is really to install it. I'm going to call it step zero, install the package. To do that, I'd recommend going to the packages list. This is the tab on the right next to your plots and help tabs. You can search in there if there's an existing package on your computer that's already installed. This is the list of packages that are on your computer. I've got quite a lot because I've installed a lot, but you should have less when you start fresh with R. And if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see that there's a section called system library, which is mostly the packages that are part of base R uh, that come with R by default and that contain the very, some of the very most important functions. Next to some of the packages, you can see that some of them are ticked. It means that they are available to use currently in your session. And those are the really the core packages of R. You've got base, you've got data sets that make available a bunch of data sets to try things. You've got graphics and graphic devices, which allow you to create visualizations, methods, stats, the stats package with lots of statistical functions and utilities. So all those ones are loaded automatically when you start R. All the other ones are available for you to use when you need them. Now, what I want to use today is a package called Praise and I need to install this one. So I'm gonna to go to install, click the install button. It opens this little dialog. So install is here. It will grab those packages the packages from the Comprehensive R Archive Network, CRAN, the website we just had a look at before, and I can look for the package praise, all lowercase. Click install, and it will go through getting the package and installing it on your computer. It should be very quick because it's a very small package. And in your list, you should then see a package called praise. Now it's on your computer. You only need to do that once. You've got it on the computer, now you can use it whenever you need to. But every time you restart R Studio, every time you start a new R session, you need to do the step of loading the package. And that's with the library function. So I'm going to use library with the argument praise, the name of the package, execute that, and then I'll be able to run the function For example, there's a function called praise inside the package praise. I just named the same. And if I execute that, no arguments needed, I get the answer, you are funkadelic. And if you don't like the answer, you can 
run it again and get another nice comment. You are great. Again, you are fabulous. This package is a really very small one that just gives you this little function that say nice things to the user. Um, so you can make use of that in your own functions to, to have nice feedback, for example. It's just an example package for our first package we install. Again, the process is install the package. You only need to do this once. Unless you want to update it. Load the package when you need it every time you, run, you start a session if you need to, to use it. And then you'll be able to use the functions inside it. We'll have a look at another example here. There's a package called schema. You can go to the install button, look for the package schema, all lowercase with no E, so S K I M A schema. Click on install to install this one. I won't do it because I already have it. I can check in my package list here, search for schema. There it is, schema, compact and flexible summaries of data. I can see the version. I can have a look at the description on the documentation page or the official website rather. And once I've got that installed, I can try and use the function. There's a function called skim, and I'm going to use it on the package gapminder. Now, when I do this, it's going to tell me error in skim could not find function skim. So what I've done here is that I forgot to load the package. I didn't run library schema. So that's the first thing I need to do. Load it with library schema. Run that function. Now it's available to use. So now I can run the next one. Schema. Skim gapminder. And it's a nice little function that Make some more space so you can see. Gives you an alternative to the um, summary, the usual summary. So still working on Gapminder, what it gives you is that it gives you the size of the data set and the name. It gives you the different kinds of data that you've got in the different columns. And then for each one of the variables, well, first it starts with characters. It tells you <clears throat> the number of unique values in there. So we know that there's 142 countries and there's five different continents. It also gives you the length of the names. And if you go to the numeric section, it gives you different information, which makes sense because, um, because uh, yeah, you can give different summary stats for different kinds of data. And it also gives you this nice little histogram, text-based histogram. So it's a nice alternative to summary. You can see that it's a, a good extension to R to know about. If you're not happy with the default summary from base R, you can install schema and use the scheme function to get those nicer summaries. So alternative to the summary function. Right, now this brings us to the end of our session, of our workshop. But I just want to finish with talking about the benefit of using a script, how you deal with saving your script and working with projects, and also how you deal with not saving your environment. I've saved my script. You can see that if you start editing it, it shows you the, the title in a different color. Make sure that you you save your script because this is really your unit of reproducible work. This is the thing that you can rerun to do exactly the same thing. This is the <clears throat> script that you can share with others to support, uh, to give evidence of what you've done, or also to let other people learn from your work or reuse your work. So it goes from top to bottom in a chronological series of steps through importing your data with this command, having a look at some information from that data set, 
looking at summary statistics, then plotting a visualization. And this is the most important bit that you want to save. So when you close R Studio, again, there's this dialog that pops up that says, do you want to save your workspace? You might think, well, yeah, maybe I want to save my Gapminder data set for later when I go back to my project. I do want to have that available. Again, what I recommend to say is don't save. Because the idea is when you go back to the R project, you open R Studio again. By default, what R Studio does is that it goes back to your latest project, but you can definitely jump from one to another by using the, the project menu at the top right and clicking on a different one. You can see that we, don't, we didn't save the environment, the workspace, so there's nothing in there. You've got a fresh R session in your console, but you have your script, and this is the important bit. You can go through your script again to do everything you need or to do everything you've done before. One thing we could change in our script is we could comment out this because you only need to download the file once. Now we've got the file inside our data directory. So you don't need to re-download it every time, but you could say, well, I keep the command here. I just comment it out to make sure we don't run it every time. But everything else, I can just select the whole script, control enter, and it goes through each one of the command the commands <coughs> and gives you the output and shows you the plot as well, gives you the data set. So you know exactly what has happened because again, this is your plain text history. You know that what has happened is exactly what is listed in this script from top to bottom. And you get exactly to the same point. It takes less than a second. You've got all your outputs in the console. You've got your data set here and you've got your plots here. Now those things you can definitely export. You can export a modified version of your data set. You can export your plots as an export menu, but we talk a bit more about that in, in other workshops. And if you want an alternative to importing your data set with this command, you can definitely use the more guided menu that's import the data set that's right here. But I would strongly recommend to once you've got the code that allows you to import a data set, include that in your script. So really your script is now self-contained. It does everything you need. It's, it's got it all in there. You don't need to click buttons anywhere to get to your processed visualized data. Right. And that's it for us. Uh, there is all the relevant links in the description if you need them. I hope that that was a useful session for you and I recommend following along the, the extra videos that we've got uh, also published. Thank you for joining and all the best with your R adventures. Take care. Bye.